Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our morning worship here at Eaglesham Parish Church. I hope you are all well and thank you for joining us this morning and thanks to people watching on the live stream. Again, I am not Jade, but thankfully Jade has uh, tested negative now. She is able to come out of isolation, which we are so grateful for. We thank God for um, being with her in that process and we pray that she would continue to um, find energy um, and recover in the coming days. We have a few intimations. Good morning, and thank you, Murdo, and thank you again to Murdo for leading us this morning uh, in Jade's absence. Um, as he said, delighted to hear that Jade is now recovering and will be back at work from tomorrow. Um, so that's wonderful news. Even better that she's able to be with Fred again. <laughs> and you, Eric, of course. <laughs> um, for those who are uh, watching and listening to us uh, remotely, uh, I'd like to say that we have had a few hiccups with our live streaming. And apologies for that. We're working hard to correct it, but there's been a few issues with the connectivity. Um, and we all know where that can go. <laughs> but we're working on it. And if for any reason the live stream goes down and you can't see all the service, it is recorded onto our YouTube channel. So you can access that. It's Eagleson Parish Church on YouTube. And so the, the service is there for you afterwards if you can't watch it live. But hopefully, fingers crossed, it is working. A couple of things that I just wanted to point out about the intimations, um, particularly for those of you who are uh, watching on the, uh, the recording or live stream. Um, we would like to thank Alan Mackay, who's going to take today's service, um, or sorry, Murdo's taking today's service, but Alan is going to uh, be preaching for us in our uh, sermon today. And also, Alan is taking this week's Thought for Thursday service. So thank you so much, Alan, for a very full week. Um, teas and coffees are available, as you'll have known from the, the order service again. We're able to have fellowship after church uh, once more, which is wonderful. Children's cor Corner is going well. And on next Saturday, which is the 12th of March, Murdo will be having a session with any children who want to come along dressed in clothes that they don't mind getting, or that parents don't mind getting messy, and they're going to decorate the, the children's corner and make it even more their own. Um, Church Pilders is on the go again uh, for any primary uh, school aged children uh, that are welcome to come along to that, learn more about Jesus and the Bible and have some fun and crafts. One thing I'd like to point out that happened last week was we, we had our speaker from Tear Fund and we had a retiring collection on behalf of Tear Fund. And I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled to tell you that the cash collection at the end of that service was £414.90, which is a wonderful amount. And that's, there may also have been card payments made as well, so, but that was the, the cash amount, which was just wonderful. Uh, talking about money, we're still looking for a new church treasurer. Uh, Elspeth Napier is retiring and won't be able to, to carry out that role for us uh, after the, well, from the summer anyway. She's, she's very kindly said she'll continue for a little bit longer if need be until we get someone, but, uh, but as soon as we can, we need to get a new treasurer. So if you know of anyone who might be able to take on that role, please speak to either myself or Jade. Um, the Sensible Shoes course will be continuing on Monday, but this Monday will be by Zoom, just to be on the safe side um, before Jade gets fully back into everything. Um, so if you are wanting to participate in Sensible Shoes, then please contact Jade and she'll send you the link uh, for the Zoom. The Lent at the Wishing Well started yesterday. So that's where we come along on a Saturday morning from 10 to 11 o'clock, um, read some Bible passages, discuss it, um, and, and share some thoughts and ideas. 
as well as some teas or coffees and scones and whatever else nice things we can have at the, the wishing well. It's, it's a lovely way of sharing fellowship and, and, um, and enjoying ourselves during Lent together. So if you would like to come along, it'll be on again next Saturday. That's at the Wishing Well from 10 till 11. Um, if you want to, to tell Gillian Norval in advance, that means we can set up the right number of places. But if you haven't managed to do so, just come along. We'll manage. The walking group are, ho are going to be enjoying this better weather, hopefully. And um, on Wednesday, this Wednesday coming, the 9th of March, they're planning to walk to the outskirts of Straven. So they'll be leaving from Mid Road at 10 a.m. and everyone is welcome to that. The Guild um, on 9th of March um, are having a return visit from the speaker Joy Blair, talking about lighthouses and Rook and Glen. And um, so that's, uh, um, oh sorry, her talk this time I think is going to be Flowers of Lockdown. Those were her previous talks. Um, so anyone wanting to come along, then 7.30 on Wednesday. The Guild would also like to just give you a little bit of heads up for a future event, which is they're going to have their bring and buy sale on the 16th of March. And the proceeds of that will go to the Ukrainian Humanitarian Appeal. Um, Messy Church is going to be back as well. So, so many things starting up again. It's wonderful. Uh, so that will be on Friday the 18th of March from 4.30 till 6.30 in the Carswell. And if you want to book a place for that, uh, then please email Kirsty Clark. And if you don't have your details, then contact Jade or myself and we'll be delighted to pass those on. Um, Epic is also starting back. And that will be from the 13th of March next Sunday. Uh, so that's for everyone in P7 to S6. And anyone wanting to come to that or want more details in advance, contact Murdo. Um, as I said last week, there's also Murdo is going to be running or helping to run a scripture union camp from the 2nd to the 9th of July. And there are places available from, for children from P6 to S6. Uh, which is a great opportunity and anyone interested to contact Murdo about that. We've also been asked to announce that the General Se Secretary of the Bible Society of Ukraine has requested help to, to, to uh, build up a stock of Bibles to distribute in Ukraine for those who are in need of spiritual support during this really difficult time for them. Um, so on our um, order of service and I think it will probably also be on the website um, is the Scottish, Scottish Bible Society link where they're looking for support to, to provide those Bibles. So that's all the intimations you'll be glad to hear <laughs> and I'll hand back to Murdo for our service. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to have our intro, but there's a small change to it. We are not going to be having Just As I Am, but instead the choir will be singing um, number 776, Kiri Ilison, which is a traditional Ukrainian chant, um, and they will follow that up with Jesus, Remember Me, and then they'll go back to the Ukrainian traditional chant. Um, so... The choir will now lead us in that.
Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 63, verses 1 to 4, which is a gather ourselves for worship. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 337, 40 Days and 40 Nights. Let us pray. God of creation, who made all things good, we come to you today in worship and adoration. You are not only creator, but also sustainer of all that there is. So, Lord, we come today with the struggles of the weak and bear our hearts to you, knowing that it is you we need in our lives. Father of love, as we enter this season of Lent, we pray that we would take this time to turn our eyes to you and the ultimate sacrifice that is your Son. Help us reflect on your word and open our minds and our hearts to be changed by your Spirit, that we might actively engage in your world as people of justice. Lord, as we look ahead to a new week, we recognize the coming stresses that may be on our mind, and we give them to you. We thank you for the coming International Women's Day, and pray that we would continue to see more work done in an effort to see more equality in our world. Forgive us, Lord, when we see injustices and choose to be complacent or indifferent, and we pray you give us gentleness and courage in our hearts. And as we pray together the words that you taught us to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's great to see so many children and young people with us today. Do you guys want to come to the front as I share with you a little bit of a thought that I've been having this week? So starting off, has anyone given up anything for Lent this year? Has anyone decided to do Lent? No? <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things that it feels like, oh, every year I'll give up chocolate or I'll give up something else. You've come for the chocolate? Ah, well, giving it up. <laughs> but I want to think about what Lent actually is, because it's a bit of a strange concept um, that we take time 40 days before Easter to stop doing certain things. And quite often it's material things that we stop. We stop eating or we stop a bad habit of some kind. But the first day of Lent is a day known as Ash Wednesday. And this is when some people might get a bit worried as they see me with matches. But I have here a candle and this match, and I'm going to light this candle if it will want to. There we go. Now, how many of you guys have had a bonfire? Yeah? Oh, we've got a bonfire over here. Yeah? A few of you guys have had bonfires. Do you like bonfires? Yeah? Yeah? I love bonfires. I was a scout when I grew up. I absolutely adored them. We would sit around a campfire and we would sing songs and we would make s'mores. Absolutely love them. Have you guys had s'mores? Yeah? Lots of not Some shakes? We'll need to fix that. <laughs> but I absolutely love sitting around a fire and thinking about what that actually means. Because candles provide light and are something that we use quite often to signify light. When I think about one of my favorite memories, it's when there was a power cut one year when I was probably your guys' age, maybe about six or seven, um, and we got candles out and we sat and we did a jigsaw in the dark with candles lighting the jigsaw. And it was an absolutely wonderful experience. But the remnants of a fire are crumbled ash. They are burnt away parts of fire. Wood burns away and we turn it into ash. And the first day of Lent is called Ash Wednesday. And that's because we signify it as a time of burning away certain things. So when people say they're giving up something for Lent, that's not meaning that they're gathering all the biscuits or gathering all the chocolate or gathering all these things and literally setting it on fire. Some of that might actually be good. If you've got marshmallows, you might get some toasted marshmallows out of it. But actually, it's a signification of taking away something that isn't great for us and burning it away to ash so that it can be good for us instead. So I want us to think more about Lent as a time not to give up lots of material things, but to give up things that actually mean a lot more, to burn away things so that we can spiritually focus a lot more on God that's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to take away those distractions, burn them away so that we can have that center. For a while, I fell into the trap of giving up things like sweets and chocolate. And what I found was I just replaced them with other things that were just as bad. I would give up sweets and chocolate, so I would have crisps. I would give up crisps, so I would have sweets and chocolate. I once gave up both, and I had cereal all the time. It was absolutely mental. One year, I found out that I was drinking up to eight cups of tea a day, so I was like, I'm going to give up tea. Didn't go so well. But instead, I have started to look at Lent as a time of giving up some different things. So I wonder if you can take this time to think about giving up things that aren't material, but personal, that impact our relationship with God. One of the things is possibly negative beliefs we have about ourselves. Sometimes we look around the world and we go, I'm awful, I'm not good enough, I'm terrible, but God loves us anyway. And I don't know about you, but if there's someone you care about and they're saying really negative things about themselves, 
you feel hurt about it because you want them to see how amazing they are in your eyes too. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to see ourselves as love. Also, any bitterness. I don't know if any of you have any grudges that you're holding on to at the moment, something someone's done that you're just like, I'm so frustrated with you. But let go of that. Because ultimately, when you're holding on to that, you're the one that's getting hurt by it, not someone else. And finally, think about giving up on self-centeredness. Stop thinking about I and start thinking about we. Stop thinking about just me and thinking about all of us. Don't make your life one that's self-centered, but one that's God-centered. I'm going to pass to Alan.
Today we have two readings. I know our bulletin says one, but we actually have two. And the first reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 39. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has given and chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who has risen, who raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him, we, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is our first reading, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. Our second reading is from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be, ever, it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants, <clears throat> but I call I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have now made known to you. This is our second reading, John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. Let's now continue with our anthem, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart.
but murder will just have to do. Thank you so much. And you can turn the volume down, folks. Thank you for putting up with my incompetence. Well, now, as I said earlier, the topic I have chosen is the love of God. And at first sight, it seems a slightly strange topic when we're living in the times that we're living in. Where is this God of love when that evil man is knocking seven bells out of a country? Where is he? Well, sitting by the ocean a few weeks ago, my wife and I began a conversation about where one ocean ends and the next one begins. As you know, there isn't a neat line on a map. They are, in fact, continuous. And the, the conversation went on to the vastness of the ocean, and that moved to a conversation on how vast is the love of God. Now, if you offer that to me, I will immediately start singing, wide, wide is the ocean, high is the heaven. And as soon as I do that, my wife's eyes go to the sky and she looks away and shakes her head. But that was how today's sermon began. And the topic, like the ocean, is so vast that I can really only scratch the surface this morning. The love of God. We've just sung one of my favorite old hymns, which tries to express the difficulty we face when we try to describe the love of God. Could we with ink the ocean fill, or were the sky of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. I sometimes think if we just put the words of the hymn up again and we read it through together two or three times, that would be fine and I could sit down. So faced with the scale of the subject, where should we begin? I think there are at least three issues we need to address before we even get started. To be in any way interested in the love of God, there are things we need to believe. Firstly, we need to believe that God exists. Now, that may seem a bit dismissive, but there are millions who do not believe that. We also need to believe that this God is interested and somehow involved with mankind. And that's another huge leap of faith. And lastly, we need to believe not just mentally, but the way we live, that God's love can somehow change us. So it's not an abstract concept, this idea of the love of God. It's something that should be intimately involved in our day-to-day -day living. And if you don't believe any of these things, then what's going to follow is really just a discussion on the love of God that will be purely philosophical. And we could be discussing anything in that context if it doesn't impact on our lives. But the great Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said 70 years ago, sermons are not meant to be religious essays. It's not meant to be a lecture. We're not here for a philosophical discussion. Our worship should have an impact. And the sermon should deliver a message that we can apply to our everyday lives. So where then can we start to find out about the love of God? I don't think we can start in a better place than with Jesus himself. John wrote in chapter 1, verse 14 of his gospel, the Word was made flesh 
and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You want to know about the love of God? Look and learn from his Son, Jesus. Paul wrote in Colossians 1, we look at the Son and see the God who cannot be seen. Some translate that verse as meaning the creation of a seal, molten uh, lead or copper, or, and then you take the seal and impress the seal in the mold. So you get a perfect replica of the seal. Such is Jesus as the Son of God, an exact replica. They are one. The original Greek of our New Testament uses quite a number of words for love. Eros is fairly obvious and relates to physical love. Philia, again, fairly obvious, the sort of love that is shared between family members. A new one on me is storge, S-T-O-R-G-E. It's a wee bit less obvious, maybe you all know it. Anyway, it means empathy, empathetic love. But the word that's used for the love of God is agape. And this is the highest form of love and takes on a unique divine dimension. So what are the characteristics of God's love? I found myself thinking. I know I'm meant to have a rule of three. I never quite managed that when I started preaching, you know, three topics and everyone waits for the third and hopes that it won't be too long. Well, I've got six this morning. <laughs> well, it's a nice bright day. It doesn't get dark till late, so I thought we would go for it. And so we've got six. And you might have others. I have actually thought of others since I prepared the sermon. Here are a few. The first thing about God's love that struck me is that his love is the love of a creator. God created us in his own image to be his companions and the objects of his love. He loves us as only a creator can love his creation. Secondly, his love is unconditional. We can't do anything to earn God's love. If you're thinking of creating good things to put in the credit side of your spiritual bank book, you're barking up the wrong tree. God will not love you more because you're doing more good things. God loves you and me unconditionally. And even more remarkably, we can never lose God's love. There are many verses that describe the fact that believers are held firmly in the hand of God, and no one and no thing can pluck them out. Our love is fickle, his is constant and unconditional. People have spoken to me over the years and said, you know, Alan, I used to believe, I used to come to church, and I used to think it mattered but I haven't lived a very great life and I don't think God's interested in me now. He couldn't be. That is quite wrong. No one and no thing can pluck you out of the Father's hand when you have accepted him as your Savior. It is a permanent relationship based on his love, not the strength of yours and mine. Thirdly, his love is everlasting. Time itself and the very earth we live on may pass away, and goodness knows the frailty of our earth has been brought before our eyes day after day in the last ten days. But God's love will remain. In Isaiah 54, we read, With everlasting love, I have compassion on you. And in Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And Eric read for us from Romans 8, nor height, nor depth, 
nor any other creation shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. His love is everlasting. Fourthly, and perhaps most remarkably of all, God wants us to be the recipients of his love. There is a God-shaped space in the center of every human soul. And he wants to fill that space with his love. It's the missing jigsaw piece that makes us the human beings we were meant to be. Perfectly possible to live without it. Perfectly possible to ignore it. But our Christian belief is that without it, we do not live the life that God intended for us. He came to give us life, and life more abundant. You can have life without the jigsaw piece. It simply won't have the abundance that the God of love wants for every one of us. And how can I dare to say such outrageous things? Because the Bible says so. Perhaps the most famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. Whoever, that's you and it's me. Such is the remarkable gift of God's love. I'm at number five. God's love is a father's love. In accepting his salvation, we become part of God's family, just as he always intended. He loves us as our father. And again in 1 John, this time in his epistle, chapter 3, behold what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This love of God is so vast that he has adopted every single believer through all the ages past and to come into his family as his children. I said earlier that a sermon must have a message that we can apply to our day-to-day -day living to find the implication of accepting God's love as a meaningful part of our lives. Let's look at what the Bible has to teach us. And shock horror, I'm going to read from a modern translation. Here is what Peterson has to say in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. After talking about God's involvement in our lives, my response is to get down on my knees before the Father, this magnificent Father who parcels out all heaven and earth. I ask him to strengthen you by his spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, you'll be able to take in with all followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length. Plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. That is the practical outcome of accepting God's love into our lives. I wonder if we can look at the horizons of our life and see God's love stretching way off into the horizon. 
But you know as well as I do that when you look at the horizon you could see but could somehow travel to it, beyond that horizon, there's another horizon. And then there's another horizon. There is more, so much more to God's love. It keeps on giving, keeps on caring. To change the analogy, it'll not surprise you to know that I'm no great computer buff. I'm very happy to switch it on and make me have access to my emails. But some folks are fantastic at it. I don't use a fraction of what my computer is able to do. I don't use a fraction of what my mobile phone is able to do. But some people can plumb the depths. Now, God's love is rather like that. You can rely on it, unlike some computers, but you will never exhaust it. You can trust your very life on its certainty. And that's a profound and heavy statement. Imagine if you were being bombed in Ukraine today or waiting on the fleet to land at Odessa and wipe out that beautiful city, would you trust your life to God's love then? None of us know the answer to that question because until you're in the situation, you can't know. But God's Word tells us we can trust His love. We will never exhaust it. Its eternal certainty is assured. And whatever depths of God's love you plumb, there is always more. His love is inexhaustible. Our understanding of God's love is limited by us, not by his desire to offer us more and more. Lastly, those words you always like to hear from a preacher. Lastly, his love is entirely undeserved and, as I hinted earlier, cannot be earned. We love because he first loved us. Our human love can be sweet and precious, but it's a mere shadow of God's love. The rich young ruler discovered in the New Testament we can't do things to be rewarded with God's love. You remember his pleading question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him in a parable to go and love his neighbor. God's love is offered freely. Our role is to accept it. There's no need for it to be any more complicated than that. This is not an academic debate. This is a willingness to open our hearts and lives to a free gift. God is love. God loves us. He wants to give his love to us. And each one of us need to accept his free gift. And as we accept his gift, it comes with so much more. So if we've accepted God's love, what are we to do with it? Well, again in John's Gospel, which is dominated by the theme of love, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if ye love one another. Tragically, the image that God's church on earth has is not an image of people who love one another. It's an image of people who scrap with one another, discuss with one another, fall out with one another, cross the street and build another church instead of worshiping in the one that's already there. But if we want to be characterized by love, we need to start by loving one another and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Our lives, our lives should be dominated by love for others. God's gift comes with so much. Ultimately, it comes with his life, eternal life. Amen. 
And now we'll sing together hymn 198, Let us build a house where love can dwell. We will now have our prayer for others. <clears throat> Let us pray. Longing for light, we wait in darkness, says the hymn. God, our hope and our redeemer, so many wait in darkness today, seeking light. 
some wait in the darkness of illness, either their own or that of a loved one. They wait for a diagnosis or for test results, unsure of what that might bring. They wait for an appointment so that treatment can be arranged. They wait for an operation to alleviate pain. They wait for any sort of news, praying that it will be good news. Some wait in the darkness of want, the homeless uncertain where tomorrow's meal will come from, the poor hearing news about increasing food and energy prices and uncertain how they will be able to cope when they already struggle, the lonely seeking companionship whilst remaining concerned about going out with COVID still affecting people. Yet others wait in the darkness of conflict, when all that has seemed certain has become uncertain. All that seemed normal has changed for the worse. All that seemed safe has become dangerous, and an end seems far off with more suffering to come. War has brought upheaval to so many people in so many countries where there is now profound instability. From Ukraine, which is now at the forefront of the news, to Syria, to Yemen, to all too many African states, closer to home to Northern Ireland in the recent past, and where some tensions still simmer. Longing for peace, our world is troubled. Lord, we do have a light. Christ, be our light, says the chorus of the hymn. That light promised so long ago to the first Christians is constant and eternal. It never fails and cannot be extinguished. Let your light be seen by those in darkness. We pray that those troubled by illness can feel comfort in the warmth of your light. We pray that those worried by want can feel comfort in the sustenance of your light. We pray that the lonely can feel comfort in the companionship of your light. We pray that those afflicted by war can feel comfort in the security of your light. We pray that your influence can bear on those with the ability to change things, particularly in situations of war. We pray that wars can cease, that the aggressors will see the futility of trying to subdue another people while stoking hatred and resistance through their actions. And we pray for success and arrangements for safe passage for those trying to escape conflict. Make us your own, your holy people, light for the world to see. Lord, let us never forget that we have a vital part to play in making your light more visible to those in the darkness. People have prayed for the unwell and have visited or telephoned them, offering lifts to those who need one. People have donated to food banks and lobbied for controls over price increases. People keep in touch with the lonely. People have opened their homes to refugees from war and donated to charities seeking to provide support whilst praying for an end to hostilities. Let us remember that we have a duty of care for your people, a duty to do what we can, however little, however simple, to shed light into their darkness. We thank you for those who have already responded and pray that you will show us what more we can do and how we can do it. May we all be alert to your prompting and quick to act so that your light may indeed be seen to shine in this church of your people gathered today. We ask all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 624. In Christ there is no east or west.
May the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon us and upon all our work and worship done in his name. May he give us light to guide us, courage to support us, and love to unite us now forevermore. Amen. <laughs>